Hi everybody and welcome back. I'm Seth Monahan, professor of music theory, and this is video number 10 in my series on the basics of classical harmony and counterpoint. Our task in this video is to get up to speed with what are called non-chord tones. Now before we learn what non-chord tones actually are, we need to step back and make a few crucial observations. The first, and the most important, is that classical compositions, like so much Western music, tend to be based on a series of chords. That's not to say all chords are equally important, but it would be rare to find a passage you couldn't break down to some underlying chord progression. At the same time, though, it's extremely rare to find composers using only the notes from the chords they've chosen. It does happen. Consider the passage on the screen. This is the first prelude of Bach's massive set called the Well-Tempered Clavier. And as we listen, I want you to notice two things. One is that Bach changes chords at a very regular rate. It's one chord per bar. And the other thing is that each bar contains only the notes of the chord Bach is using. He simply arpeggiates each chord twice in each bar. Let's listen. Now there's a name for this kind of piece. It's called a figuration prelude. This is a Baroque genre in which a composer takes some chord progression and then brings it to life with all kinds of bustling rhythms and arpeggios of various sorts, but not usually any kind of overtly lyrical melody. This is not a piece you walk away singing. But even in that genre, it's remarkable that Bach's piece uses only chord tones. Far more often in the West, pieces contain melodic notes that are not part of the chord that happens to be sounding at that moment. To show you what I mean, let's look at a piece written over a hundred years after Bach's prelude, and that's the famous Ave Maria by French composer Charles Gounod. Now, this piece is something of a stunt, because as you'll see here, Gounod composed this by just taking Bach's prelude, scoring it for a huge orchestra, and adding a vocal melody on top of it, making it less like a Baroque figuration prelude and more like a romantic aria. Let's listen to it performed. Now, initially, Gounod's melody uses only tones from the underlying chords. The E is from the C major chord, the F is from the D minor seventh, there's G and D from the dominant chord, E again from the tonic. But in the second system, he starts to use notes that are not in the underlying chords. These, and I've circled them in red here, are called non-chord tones, or some people call them non-harmonic tones. Let's zoom in on bars 5 and 6 to see what he's done here. Now here's a close-up of the score with a harmonic analysis underneath, and just to remind you how it sounds. So as I already hinted, the B natural here that I've circled is not part of the underlying chord. The chord is 2-6 in G major, which is an A minor triad, A, C, and E, and B is none of those. But let's pay special attention to how Gounod uses that B natural. He uses it to connect two chord tones, A and C, with a smooth, stepwise melodic motion. Here's the chord. Stepwise motion through B, connecting A and C, and there's a special name for this. It's called a passing tone. Passing tones are one of the most common non-chord tones, and they always connect chord tones that lie a third apart, and they always involve only stepwise motion. We move in and out by step in a single direction. Now let's look at the E natural in the next bar. This too is not part of the underlying chord. We've got a D dominant seventh here, and E is not part of that. And like the passing tone, this one is also approached and left by step. But the difference is that we reverse direction rather than moving in a straight line. This is called a neighbor tone. And instead of connecting two pitches, it embellishes a single pitch by moving to an adjacent note and then right back again. 
by step. Passing and neighbor tones are among the most common non-chord tones in classical music, and we're going to see several variations on them below. But before we look at other types of non-chord tones, we should make a few broad observations. First, you should know that non-chord tones are usually dissonant. They usually clash with the underlying chord, and therefore they require special, careful treatment in the classical style. The other important point is that non-chord tones are always classified by their melodic relation to the surrounding tones. We already saw this in the difference between the linear directed motion of a passing tone versus the away and back gesture of the neighbor tone. But as we'll see, all non-chord tones involve stepwise motion of one sort or another, either moving in or moving out or both. So our next job is to get to know six additional types and how they move. Now there are three types of non-chord tones that we move into and out of by step, and we've seen two of them already, passing and neighbor tones. There's one more, and that's called the double passing tone. Have a look at the opening of Beethoven's fifth violin sonata, sometimes called the spring sonata. When we listen, notice two things. First, notice how slowly the chords move, but then second, notice how much rapid stepwise motion the melody uses. This guarantees that we'll be moving through a lot of non-chord tones because chord tones don't usually lie a step apart. So if you're moving by step, you're going to kind of cross over non-chord tones constantly. Here's the passage played. And let's look just at the first bar. From the piano, it's easy to see that the harmony here is the tonic chord F major, spelled F-A-C. And I'm using red here to highlight all the non-chord tones, in other words, all the notes that are not F, A, or C. Now, if we look just at the black notes, we see Beethoven moving down an F major arpeggio. There's A, he goes down to F, and then goes down to C. But the melody ornaments and fills out that arpeggio with all kinds of stepwise motion. And we already have names for a bunch of these. First one is a passing tone, passing through G between A and F. Second is a neighbor tone, the E is the lower neighbor, we go away from F and back again. And then there's the upper neighbor, G. But look at the last two red notes. Here, we actually have two non-chord tones in a row moving by step in a single direction. This is called a double passing tone, and we use it to connect chord tones that lie a fourth apart, in this case, F and C. The principle is exactly the same as a regular passing tone, except that the distance is different, we're moving through a fourth instead of a third, and now we have a non-chord tone progressing to another non-chord tone. That's E moving to D, neither of which is part of the F major chord. But because they're both clearly moving en route to that stable C, it doesn't sound strange or unusual at all. Now, before we move to the next category of non-chord tones, there's one key point I want to make about passing and neighbor tones. And for that, let's turn to the other most famous Ave Maria of the 19th century. This is the piano and voice setting by Schubert. Let's listen first and then focus on the last two bars. So the key here is B major, and Schubert ends his phrase with a typical 2, 5, 7 to 1 progression. And once again, I'm using red here to show two non-harmonic tones above that dominant chord, B flat and G above the F, A, C, E flat dominant. Now the second of these is a run-of-the-mill neighbor tone, embellishing the A above it. And the first one is a passing tone that connects A to the C that comes before it. But I want you to notice that this passing tone, unlike those we saw earlier, actually connects chord tones that fall within different chords. The C is part of the two chord, and the A is part of the dominant chord. Until now, we've seen passing and neighbor tones occurring all within a single chord, but they can also be used to connect chord tones in different chords. So let's change gears now and look at a few non-chord tones that require only one stepwise move, that being the motion out of the dissonant note in question. And let's focus now on the last two chords of bar one, moving into bar two. Once again, we've got a common progression. One, six, four, moving to five, seven, moving to six. 
Now, when we get to the 1-6-4 chord, which is spelled B flat, D, and F, the soprano has the chord tone D. But notice that she holds that chord tone well into the fourth beat of the bar and only moves after the chord has changed. When Schubert changes chords underneath her, the D becomes a non-chord tone. It's not, in other words, part of the underlying 5-7 on beat 4. So by doing this, Schubert makes the tone much less stable, giving it the urge to resolve by step to the chord tone C. This type of non-chord tone is called a suspension, because we take a stable chord tone and we suspend it in time long enough that it's eventually no longer a chord tone. Then it needs to resolve by step to an adjacent chord tone and usually downwards. Not always downwards, but usually. When we listen again, see if you can feel how the soprano's D natural builds up a kind of dissonant charge when the chord underneath it changes, making it all the more urgent that it resolve, but also how Schubert makes us wait until the very last 16th note of the bar to do so. One more quick point about suspensions. In this Schubert song, the suspended note is literally suspended from one chord to the other, and that it's sustained all the way across the chord change. But it doesn't need to be like that. Here's an excerpt from Mahler's second symphony, and as we listen, I want you to focus on the progression into the fourth bar. Now the chords here are 3 moving to 4 in D-flat major. And what we see is that the A-flat in the first chord is re-struck when the second chord arrives. And that A-flat is not part of the 4 chord, it's not G-flat, B-flat, or D-flat, and this makes this a re-articulated suspension. It's just like a regular suspension. Again, notice that the A comes from the last chord and then resolves down by step in the second chord, except that the non-chord tone is just re-struck at the chord change. Moving on. Here's another Schubert song, Nacht und Träume, or Night and Dreams. And as you listen, I want you to focus on the first two bars, where the voice unfolds a melody containing two non-chord tones over the tonic chord B major. Now the second of these is just a garden variety passing tone, connecting the chordal B with the chordal D sharp. But for the second, notice that the singer leaps into the non-chordal A sharp and then resolves by step. This is called an appoggiatura, and its hallmark is the leap followed by the step. We leap into the non-chord tone and then step away to a chord tone. Now, so far, we've moved by step out of all of our non-chord tones, and I want you to think of this as the rule rather than the exception. The five idioms we've looked at here, all the check marks on top, include the most common non-chord tones you're going to encounter in classical music. But there are three more we should look at quickly, and two of them involve moving not by step, but by leap out of a non-chord tone. Here's a passage from one of Haydn's groundbreaking Opus 20 string quartets, and we're going to focus on the bar where the first violin plays a little mini cadenza with an implied tonic harmony underneath it. Let's listen. Notice that the only chord tone here is A natural, 
Everything else in that bar is non-chordal. But the non-chord tones are arranged in pairs so that between every instance of A natural, we get both its upper neighbor B and its lower neighbor G sharp. This is called a double neighbor figure, and it allows us to leap out of the first non-chord tone, B, into the second one, G sharp, because the ear can easily hear both of those notes kind of resolving into the A that they surround. Now let's fast forward 50 years to Schubert's Ninth Symphony, composed less than a year before he died. And at the end of the first movement, one of the symphony's most important themes comes back to usher in the final cadence. And as you can see from the notes in red, he uses two non-chord tones in this progression. Let's listen. The red B natural in the first bar is just a regular passing tone. We move in and out by step. But the second, the E natural, is something we haven't seen before. We move into it by step, but out by leap. It's kind of a reverse appoggiatura. This is called an escape tone. And it's a very common embellishment to find at cadences, exactly as we see here, with scale degree two stepping up to three before jumping down to scale degree one. The last of our eight non-chord tone idioms is also usually found at cadences. Here's a passage from Schumann's Fantasy in C Major from 1836. And when I play it, listen for the red C natural over the dominant chord G7. Schumann's dominant 7th chord has D natural in the soprano. And as we might expect, that D natural will move down to C in the tonic chord. But it moves too early. When C arrives, the dominant chord is still sounding, making for a very dissonant minor ninth against the leading tone. Right there. This idiom is called an anticipation. And unlike the other non-chord tones we've looked at, it doesn't actually have to resolve. It just has to wait a second for the harmony to catch up, making it consonant again. At first, the C is very dissonant, but it becomes consonant when we go to the tonic chord at the end. And anticipations are a little bit like escape tones in that they usually follow scale degree two over a cadential dominant. Schumann could have written this with an escape tone like Schubert's piece. but instead he used the anticipation. Now that we've touched on most of the standard non-chord tone types, two tasks remain. The first is to address what are called chromatic non-chord tones. Pretty much any of the non-chord tones we've seen so far can appear in a chromatic form. Chromatic meaning using notes from outside the key by way of applied accidentals. So for a very clear instance of this, let's listen to the opening of Chopin's F minor nocturne, opus 55, number one, with a special interest in that red B natural. Just to orient you, we're in F minor here, and B natural is not a note in F minor. B flat is. But instead of embellishing that right hand C with the lower B flat, he uses the B natural, giving the passage a more melancholy sound. And as you might expect, that B natural is called a chromatic neighbor tone. For two more quick examples of chromatic non-chord tones, let's look at the opening of Mozart's G major string quartet. Now, I'll play you the first four bars, which actually have a lot of chromatic notes in them, but we're going to look in detail at just the last one. 
So here's bar four, which has five, six, five moving to tonic. Now, as you might guess, the red C sharp here, which connects chord tones C and D natural by step, is a chromatic passing tone. In by step, out by step, in a single direction. By contrast, the red A sharp is approached by leap, but since it resolves by step, we can recognize this as a chromatic appoggiatura. In by leap, out by step. Our last task is to deal with the issue of accented non-chord tones. Now, a lot of textbooks treat non-chord tones as an entirely different category of embellishments, and it's easy to see why. Accented non-chord tones are among the most powerful and expressive and attention-grabbing non-chord tones you can find, especially suspensions and appoggiaturas, which are almost always accented. But in my experience, meter doesn't tell the whole story because to be accented, something has to do more than just appear on a strong beat. Let's go back to Beethoven's Spring Sonata and compare two G naturals. Both are passing tones that connect A and F, and both appear on relatively strong beats. In this sense, they're both accented. But the second is so much more powerful because it's held for almost half a bar. The first one goes by very quickly. Whereas the second one, we really lean into. In other words, the duration of the G matters as much here as the fact that it appears on a strong beat. And that accented passing tone sets off a whole chain of accented dissonances. In this system, we have an accented neighbor E, an accented passing tone C, and then in the next system, we have a passing F, a chromatic lower neighbor D sharp, passing tone B flat, chromatic passing tone F sharp, and chromatic appoggiatura B natural. As you listen to the whole thing, try to focus on the particularly expressive power of all these accented non-chord tones. Passages like this one clearly put a lot of stock in the expressive power of accented non-chord tones. And I'll wrap up this video by just pointing out that this expressive potential was exploited constantly by composers in the generations after Beethoven. Here's a passage from the overture to Wagner's opera Tannhäuser. At the outset, there are chord tones on every strong beat, and some of these are prepared by non-chordal anticipations, as you'll hear. But this all changes at the climax, which ends with a gorgeous chain of accented passing tones. And here's a passage from Mahler's Fourth Symphony from the last year of the 19th century, and it has five really prominent appoggiaturas, just in the space of four bars. And as you listen, I want you to notice how the appoggiaturas themselves get higher and higher and then more frequent, giving the passage a kind of mounting tension that suddenly collapses in the last two bars as G major falls into E minor. So to wrap things up, I want to offer three quick disclaimers. First, you might be surprised to learn that even in a video this long, I haven't given a complete inventory of non-chord tone types. 
There are other combinations, other possibilities I haven't had time to talk about here. The double chromatic passing tone or the anticipation of an accented neighbor tone. But you should now be in a position to recognize these and identify them on your own. Second, I want to point out that there is no universal terminology for non-chord tones. I've used the terms that I prefer, but you'll find others in various textbooks. But it really doesn't matter that much, though, because the principles are universal. They're all based on the same repertoire. And while we're on the topic of repertoire, let me close by reminding you that everything I've said here is style-specific. Although, of course, we find non-harmonic tones outside of classical music, they're often treated much more freely. So if you're studying the classical style or you're trying to compose in it, a firm grasp of non-chord tone treatment is essential. Hopefully this video helped to get you there. So thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time for a discussion of classical cadences. Mm -hmm.